الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام وسيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان لا يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا التباع وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتناب السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته on behalf of Islamic Learning Foundation, I would like to welcome you to the session from commentary on the 40 hadith of Al Imam al Nawawi, rahimallah. And we are now on hadith 5. This is on the topic of ibadah and bid'ah. And it's a, another very important session in uh, looking at one of the most important hadith in Islam. And let us go further now and go to the recital of the hadith. عن أم المؤمنين أم عبد الله عائشة قالت قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من أحدث في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد رواه البخاري ومسلم ومن عمل عملا ليس عليه أمرنا فهو رد وفي رواية لمسلم So this is the hadith, hadith number five in the collection of Al-Arba'un Imam An-Nawawi and the translation is as follows it is narrated on the authority of the mother of the believers Um Abdullah Aisha Radhi Anuha that the messenger Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said whoever introduces into this matter of ours Ya'ani Islam something that does not belong to it then it is to be rejected and this is narrated in both the most authentic books of Al-Bukhari and Muslim, Mutafakkan Alay. And according to the version in Muslim, it also reads, Whosoever performs an action which has no command for it in this religion of ours is to be rejected. So now we begin with the life of, and some important points on the narrator of this hadith, which is none other than the beloved of Rasulullah Sallallahu the mother of the believers, which is a title which was endowed to her, being the most eminent of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ummil Mu'mineen, also her laqab or kunya is given by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Umm Abdullah Aisha, even though she did not have any child, but this was something given to her as a nickname or laqab. This is the full name of Aisha Wadu'anha. Aisha, of course, bint Abi Bakr. So Aisha, she has a special place in terms of the muhaddithin as she is number four in terms of the sahaba who narrate the most ahadith. And she basically is number four and has narrated approximately 2,200 hadith. She had the fadl and honor of being shown to the Prophet Sallallahu in the form of dream, which is narrated in Al-Bukhari, where the Prophet Sallallahu said to Aisha, anha, You have been shown to me in my dreams on three nights. An angel was carrying you in a silken cloth and said to me, This is your wife. And when I uncovered it, and when I uncovered it, behold, it was you. Then I said, if this dream is from Allah, he will cause it to become true. So this is a command to the Prophet ﷺ that he was to marry Aisha. And this was in the form of wahi from dreams. Narrated Amr bin al-As, I came to the Messenger of Allah, the Prophet ﷺ, and said, Ayyu nasi ahabu ilayka? He said to the Prophet ﷺ, Who is the most beloved person to you? Qal, the Prophet ﷺ said, Aisha. Then, فَقُلْتُ مِنَ rijal. Then I said, from the men. فَقَالْ Abuha. What a beautiful response to the question of Amr bin al-As, where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned first Aisha, then 
her father as the most beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. And then this is not stop the Sahabi Amr bin al-As who perhaps was expecting his name to be among those most beloved to the Prophet ﷺ because this was the beautiful personality of the Prophet ﷺ that his companions, they would deem themselves as being so beloved to him that this Sahabi had the notion that he was most beloved to the Prophet ﷺ. So he went further. And he said, I then said, who after that? Then Prophet says, Umar ibn Khattab. Then he said, Umar bin Khattab. Then after that, the Prophet added other names. And the name of Umar bin al-As was not in that list. But beautiful hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentions the, the people who are most beloved, and number one is Aisha, and then her father. And then who else is? The second Khalifa of Islam, Umar bin Khattab. And if you want to go further in that regard, in terms of the next, who would be the next, in terms of the Khulaf al Rashidin, it was, ended up being Uthman Radan. And indeed, in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Uthman had a higher status than Ali Radan despite the great status which Ali Adan had himself. Anyway, let's go forward into the beautiful and important life of Aisha Adanha. Okay. She also had the honor of Jibreel alayhi salam conveying her salam. And of course, this was another uh, na'ma and blessing which was given to the first wife of the Prophet sallallahu Khadija bint Khwailid, who Actually, despite the great status of Aisha Adana among the wives of the Prophet and the women, had actually a higher status than her. And of course, we cannot forget the other highest women in Islam, which are of course Maryam, and uh, then then Asiya, then also Fatima uh, bint Muhammad anhum. Anyway, so Aisha Adana also had the honor of being given direct salams from Jibreel alayhi salam when there was an incident where the Prophet was with Aisha and she did not see Jibreel alayhi salam but of course our dear beloved Prophet did. Going forward, more about Aisha. So Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal narrated the ayat of Surah Nur 11 to 21 to defend the honor of Aisha when her character was being slandered with allegations Allah, of adultery. Of course, this story was erected and uh, fabricated by the, the big munafiq of Al Madina. Uh, but uh, it was Allah Zawajal, who narrated and dropped these ayats in Surah Nur to defend the honor of Aisha with Anha. Another occasion where the revelation of the words of Tayammam was also related to an incident where Aisha Anha had lost her jewelry and the Prophet made the companions in the whole caravan stop to search for it and they basically had a difficult time in terms of finding water for the salah. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down on this occasion ayah number 43 in Surah Nasa of Tayammum. And it was amazing because here Usaid bin Khudair said, Oh, the family of Abu Bakr, this is not the first blessing of yours, Nari in Bukhari. The intellect and knowledge of Aisha was also extremely high and extremely supreme among the women and even among the Sahaba. She was well versed in various subjects, including even poetry and the Arabic language and medicine also and was also praised by special people such as Az-Zuhri and also her student Urwa bin Al-Zubair. Az-Zuhri said of her, if Aisha's knowledge is compiled and compared to the knowledge of all the women, her knowledge will surely excel theirs. Abu Musa al-Ashir said, whenever a hadith was unclear to us, Ya'ni the companions, and we asked Aisha about it, we always gain knowledge about it from her regarding that hadith. Likewise, Aisha was also an authority in the realm of fiqh. During the Khulafa Rashidin, her fatawa were accepted despite great 
Sahabi and companions being there. But again, the fatawa of Aisha were accepted nonetheless because of her authority in that realm. She Anha passed away at the age of 65 and this was dated at 57 after Hijri and she was uh, her janazah was led by none other than Abu Huraira Anhu, and she was buried in Jannatul Baqi and there's so much more we can talk about regarding the blessing and the bounty of Aisha Anha. and it's important in this age that unfortunately there is there are groups of people, certain sect or sects, which try to slander and put down the name of Aisha because of certain difference that she may have had with another companion such as Ali wa Anhu. And it's unfortunate we have to protect the legacy and the name of Aisha and other certain Sahaba wa Anhu. Anyway, let's go forward. And now we're going to transition into looking at this hadith. Like Hadith 1, this Hadith is one of the most important Hadith in Islam. Okay. And we even preluded that when we were talking about the Hadith of intention, that the Sunnah goes with this Hadith, the Hadith of intention in terms of determining the criteria of actions. According to Imam al-Nawawi, this Hadith should be memorized by every Muslim, and this is indeed a very short Hadith. Hadith man ahdata min amrina hada ma alaysa min fahuwarad. Very simple, just a one sentence. All of you, inshallah, could can memorize this without much difficulty. Bi'idnillah. So, this hadith, as we mentioned a few times in the other prior hadith sessions, is used as a criteria for judging external actions of ibadah. Okay. Based on the text of this hadith, if an action is not done in accordance with the Sharia or the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, it will not be accepted by Allah Azawajal. It's the Andalusian Maliki scholar, Imam Ash-Shaqwabi, Rahimallah, who wrote the great work and the unique work, Al-Iqtisam, which provides the most comprehensive and concise definition of Sunnah and Bid'ah. He also is a great prolific author and known for also writing about Maqasid al-Sharia, the higher objectives of Islamic law. So in terms of reference point four, Sunnah and Bid'ah, you go to the works of Imam al-Shatabi, rahimahullah. Lessons from this hadith. The acceptance of actions. This hadith complements, of course, as we said before, hadith number one, the hadith on intentions, which is a criteria for judging the intentions or the inner actions of the heart, Scholars say that the acceptance of actions of ibadah are judged based on two conditions. Number one, niyyah, where actions are done with sincerity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And then number two is the conformity to the sunnah. Okay. The conformity to the sunnah where actions are done in accordance to the teachings and the example of the Prophet sallallahu okay. alayhi And this is where this hadith comes in. Apart from hadith number one and hadith number five, which is this hadith, the acceptance of actions is also mentioned in, in Surah Kaf. Allah Azawajal says in Surah Kaf, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُو لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا So this is uh, Shaykh Al-Husri uh, reciting this beautiful ayah of Surah Kaf and the translation is as follows where Allah Azawajal says Whoever looks forward to meeting his Lord, let him do righteous deeds and let him not ascribe unto anyone or anything a share in the Lordship, in the worship due to his Lord. Ayah 110. So following the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To emulate and follow the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a Quranic obligation. And Allah Azawajal also says in Surah Ahzab, Ayah 21, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا 
Allah says, Verily in the Apostle of Allah you have the best example to emulate for everyone who looks forward with hope and awe to Allah in the last day and remembers Allah unceasingly. And Allah also says in Surah Ali Imran, Ayah 31, Allah says, Say, O Prophet, if you love Allah, follow me. And Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. What more can we want than the love of Allah and the forgiveness of all our sins? May Allah grant us this mercy. And so here these are two very powerful ayat which just mirror again this hadith in terms of importance, in terms of the place of the sunnah, in terms of forming the criteria of our actions. So now turning to Sunnah in Ibadah in a more specific detail. This hadith describes an essential part of Islam which is following the Sunnah. Acting contrary to the Sunnah leads to bid'ah or deviation or innovation. This is discussed in detail also in the commentary of hadith number 28 where the Prophet says the following. فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي وَسُنَّتِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِئِينَ أَضْضُوا عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِدِ وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ فَإِنَّ كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَ And Rasul Sallallahu says in this powerful hadith also, and upon you, and obligatory on you, is to observe my sunnah and also the sunnah of the rightly principled and guided successors. Hold on to them with your molar teeth. Addu bin nawajid. And beware of newly invented or introduced matters for every bidha is an error. For inna kulla bidatin bulala. So scholars classify actions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into two. Okay. Two divisions. One, there's actions which are done for the purpose of ibadah, worshipping Allah. And there's also other things which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did for a purpose other than that of worship. And this is basically where the Prophet did cultural or customary actions, spontaneous actions, which were not done for the niyyah of pleasing Allah The Prophet was a human being. And there's many things he did as a human being to fulfill his needs. And he was also part of a certain culture. The Arabs, they had their own customs as well. And many things were not really from a religious standpoint. So we have to understand that as well. And this comes through a detailed look at the ahadith and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Because sometimes an action of the Prophet ﷺ may appear to be that of ibadah, but in reality it's not. So it's important to distinguish between these two types of actions done for the Prophet ﷺ. Because Muslims are only expected to follow the first type, which is a true sunnah. Ibadah. Ibadah should only be done in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay. In performing an act of ibadah, there are five elements that we need to know in order to keep our actions in concordance to the sunnah, and these are the following. Okay. So let us look at these five important aspects of ibadah, particularly its framework according to the sunnah. Okay. On a side note, if you look at this picture, mashallah, you have his brother praying, but some people may object to something which he's doing, which is wearing shoes. The question is, or food for thought, is, is this okay or not? Is this salah going to be accepted? Okay. So hold on to the thought. Some of you perhaps already know the answer. Some of you may not. But you know, think about that as we go through these five areas. Number one is time. The time of the performance of the ibadah. Many ibadat are required at a designated time or place. For example, we have the times for the Five obligatory prayers, and that's been fixed. We can't change that. We can't pray Fajr after the sun has risen. Okay, we can't pray Aisha before dawn. I mean, those things are fixed, and this is according to the Sunnah of the Prophet. 
Fasting is an obligatory deed which we do in the month of Ramadan and occurs only between Fajr and sunset. To change the timing in terms of when we fast, whether it's a certain different month or different period of the day is going to be again, is going to render your deed or your fast batal. Uh, there's also a specific time for Hajj, 8th of Dhul Hijjah to the 12th. You can't change that. Okay. So time has been delineated by the Prophet ﷺ for many ibadah. The place also can be a factor. Okay. So certain ibadat need to be performed at certain specific designated places, such as, for example, Hajj and Itikaf. Also places to get into the Ihram, are also specified for the Sharia. Sometimes Muslims violate this when they get into the Ahram with Niyyah in Jeddah, for example, for the Hajj and start reciting the Talbiyah. So it has to be done in the Miqat, for example, if you want to go to Hajj or Umrah. The quantity of the Ibadah. And we mentioned this before, for example, like someone who wants to have the intention of doing good and wants to change the Sunnah of the Fajr from 2 to 3, and they think that oh, it's one extra rakah, we go get more Ajr. But again, this goes against the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay. Also, for example, the Tawaf or on the Kaaba, it's been fixed at seven, not eight. Okay. The manner of the Abada is also important as well. For the Prophet, is the best model to follow and emulate. Okay. Every form of Ibadah or worship has been described or shown by him. This should not be violated by acting contrary to that or inventing another way of doing that ibadah. For example, there are different ways of performing different salawat. The salatul janazah has no ruku or sujood. The dhuhar and asr prayers have to be recited silently or in a minimal tone as opposed to the rest. In fact, to recite loud is a mistake which needs to be corrected, which is the saw, if that happens accidentally. The Prophet ﷺ said, Sallu kama raithumuni usalli. Beautiful, simple hadith where he said, Pray as you have seen me praying. And this is an authentic hadith narrated by Malik bin Huwayra in Sahih al Bukhari. Anyway, let's go forward also in terms of number five specific things used for certain ibadah. The Sharia associates certain ibadat with certain types of items. For example, the type of animal used for the Udhiyya or sacrifice is specified by the Sharia. This cannot be changed or disregarded. The author of this book, the commentary we're using, mentioned that a scholar made a fatwa that Muslims can use chickens for sacrifice. This is of course rendered void to do such a thing because this is not specified by the parts of Islam. Udhiyya is sheep or goat or the cow. Now, going back to this picture that we uh, question you about and we see this brother is wearing shoes during the salah and it is okay to wear shoes or sandals during the salah and this was a practice which was done actually by the early Muslims including the Prophet Wasallam. I mean at that time they did not have prayer rugs in the masjid in the Prophet's masjid it was basically dirt and sometimes it would rain also so it would be something which they would do regularly and it's inshallah no problem as long as you have the wudu you can wear the shoes and of course if there's no najas on them, can be used as well. So we have to actually get more knowledge. I mean, many times people, even in the matter of like wearing shoes for salah, they become very hesitant and they have doubt because they don't have the knowledge. We have to gain knowledge in the bigger things of Islam and also the minor things such as the salah because these things really will, at the end of the day, uh, formulate and shape a lifetime, inshallah, of ibadah, and we have to try to perfect our ibadah to the biggest details and also even down to the smallest ones, and also gain more knowledge about what the Prophet actually did his actions in accordance with. So, if you don't know the sunnah, then we don't know the sunnah. And then, things such as, for example, wearing shoes during salah, we're going to have doubt about. And it can really sometimes be an obstruction in terms of the worship of Allah. Let's go forward now to the topic of. Bid'ah and its rejection. And I want to point you to the, again, the picture in the top of the screen where you have the twirling dervishes. The whole question is, is this okay? Is there a bid'ah in terms of this action? And what's the reality in terms of this? Is it allowable? Okay, so we'll go over that. And I think this is an excellent 
example of and connection with bid'ah and the topic here. So Islam is a complete religion and without any deficiencies and need for any additions. Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Ma'idah, ayah number three. So Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al Ma'idah, this day I have perfected for you your religion and completed my favor upon you and have approved you Islam as religion or the religion. And this is a very important ayah of, again, the fact that Islam has been completed for us and that there is no need for any addition. Rasul Sallallahu was sent to perfect the final message until the end of time. And this is where the sunnah comes in as well, that he through his actions and being the best of character, has perfected and exemplified the deen, the Qur'an, and there's no need for any addition. Any addition to that is labeled bid'ah, that it is an insult to, to the deen and religion. So bid'ah is defined as a violation to the limits set by the sharia. When something new is added to it, okay, in terms of a nibada or a religious matter, and that's important as an ibadah or religious matter. Our life, certain things, needs, they evolve and there's going to be new things. But in the realm of religion or practice, there can not be any addition because it has been completed and perfected by Allah Azawajal. So this occurrence of adding something new causes an ibadah to be wholly rejected because it is, becomes a abidah. So to introduce any new matter to it or to delete or omit something from it is a direct insult to Islam itself. Furthermore, it is a form of disrespect to Allah Azawajal, the Most High and also His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Well, this type of violation in Islam is a major sin and needs to be avoided. It is not simply a matter of the ibadah not being accepted. For example, Ibn Al-Qayyim in Tafsir of Surah An-Nas mentions that the first thing that shaitan will do in terms of waswas is to is to swerve you from the deen in terms of iman in terms of pushing you towards shirk and after that he will swerve you to bid'ah which is innovation which is a major sin because it also is an avenue to go towards shirk itself and if you look at the story of Nuh alayhi salam in surah Nuh in terms of the the evolution of the people of Nuh from Tawheed to Shirk, and we see the influence of Shaitan. How really they basically, Shaitan introduced Bid'ah to the people to the point where they, it became Shirk, Ma'adullah. So, nonetheless, Bid'ah is not a small matter, it is a great matter. Okay. And if you look at the picture above, the trolling dervishes, this practice started in the 12 or 1300s, and this type of dancing, the niyyah behind this, or the intention is to get closer to Allah Azawajal. Okay. Never ever did the Prophet ever sanction this type of behavior to twirl and to dance and to replace this or have something which is almost like a prayer and say that you get more closer to Allah Azawajal. Any such practice like this or other, like for example the dhikr chants and things which the process of never sanctioned or had any type of association with is 100% bid'ah and is to be avoided and it's a major sin. It's not a minor thing as some of the mystics may condone. It's something which is a major sin. It has to be rejected. Uh, we have to be gentle but firm in terms of rejecting these type of practices which are adulterating the pure sunnah of the Prophet wasallam and the deen which Allah has perfected. There's no need for actions such as this. The Prophet already, through his beautiful character, legislates the actions which are pleasing to Allah in terms of prayer, in terms of dhikr, in terms of other actions which elevate us. These actions only bring us down and corrupt us and wipe away our good deeds. So bid'ah we have to avoid, and again the twirling dervish is a testament to an example of what bid'ah is. The sharia is based on ease. 
scholars have deduced that we should not attach any hardship to our ibadah, hoping that it will grant us more reward. The Sharia is based on ease. Allah Azawajal says, You read the law, you read the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for you ease and does not want for you hardship. So, for example, you look at this picture here. This person is doing masa on socks, but you see that it is this is a cotton sock that is being wiped over. So the whole question now becomes, is this okay? I mean, if it was a leather sock, there would be no question because those hadith are mutawatir. But the question is, is it okay for us to do or wipe over cotton socks? Or did the Prophet ﷺ allow for socks to be, cotton socks to be wiped over? That's the question. Well, inshallah, look at this in a few moments. Going forward, Imam al-Shaqbabi, Rahimallah states that if there exists more than one way of fulfilling an obligation, we should choose the easiest way. So for example, if the weather is cold and we have the choice of using either warm or cold water, we should use the warm water. Because this is easier. Okay, This is going to prevent us from hardship. Anas bin Malik narrates the following, where three men came to the houses of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, asking how the Prophet وسلم, worshipped and when they were informed about that they considered their worship as insufficient and said where are we from the Prophet وسلم, as his past and future sins have been forgiven then one of them said I will offer the prayer throughout the night forever the other said I will fast throughout the year and will not break my fast and the third said I will keep away from women and will not marry forever. Then Allah's Messenger came to them and said, kultum kada wa kada? Ama wallahi inni lillahi wa lahu lakinni asumu wa aftiru wa asalli wa arkudu wa atazawwuju nisa faman rahiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Here the Prophet ﷺ said, are you the same people who said so and so? By Allah, I am more submissive to Allah and more afraid of Him than you. Yet I fast and I break my fast. I do sleep and I also marry women. So he who does not follow my tradition in the religion is not from me. فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Very famous hadith. And this is in Sayy Bukhari and Kitab nikah So, Ease is the methodology of the Prophet ﷺ and to follow his sunnah and example. There's no need to go into excess. The Prophet ﷺ was about moderation. And if there's any, if you want to do more, then do it to the limits prescribed to the Prophet ﷺ. So fasting, for example, if you want to excel the fast, do not fast every other day, but do the best fast, which is the fast of Da'ud as we mentioned before. And if you want to do the night prayer, do it, but also sleep part of it, as this was the custom of the Prophet. Okay. And in terms of marriage, this is the sunnah of the Prophet as well. Going back to this picture of this person wiping the sock, there is a Hassan hadith which mentions that masa or wiping on the top of the khan sock or jawarib can be done. And this is a Hassan hadith, so inshallah, this is okay. And it's actually very useful, particularly for those who are praying and don't have the luxury of using a personal bathroom. And it's really helpful, particularly to pray in our workplaces as well. So go ahead and be free to wipe over the cotton socks, inshallah, as long as they cover the ankle. Going forward, fiqh issues. Okay. Ibn Rajab, he states that there are different views with regard to two separate actions performed simultaneously when one action violates the Sharia while the other does not. So let's then take the example of this man who is wearing silk and performing his prayer. Is his prayer accepted? What about a man who prays in a house which is stolen or taken by force from his rightful owner? Okay. So most scholars are of the opinion that his ibadah is accepted, but the individual will be accountable for the sin. For the person you're praying behind, even his salah, the one who has a gold watch, his salah is going to be accepted. However, he is accountable for that 
wearing that watch which is gold and remember gold is actually wearing gold is actually a major sin performing his salah his salah will be accepted but he will be accountable for that sin of wearing that gold watch okay and similarly the people praying behind him their salah inshallah will be accepted as well okay. so we have to give nasiha to them and to discourage and just continue their sins but encourage them to continue doing good deeds because people are of different types. They are sometimes very hard-headed, just like sheep. You know, some sheep you can steer them towards the, the group of sheep. And other sheep you need to give them a little spanking and hit them hard to get them going in the right way. They're stubborn. They're more stubborn. They need a little bit more force to get them to be guided. And similarly, people are this way as well. There's the sheep which are nice and easy-mannered. And if they're, they go astray, they'll follow your advice without much much issue but others were just stubborn and they're just going to be insisting on certain sins but yet you have to continue giving nasiha to them in the most feasible and the most wise way because sometimes it takes time for people to shake off their bad deeds we just have to sometimes be patient with them and not get too emotional and not do anything rash and push them away too much okay just stick with them continue to advise them sometimes it takes some time and it can take a lot of sabr as well so I just want to share a story with you regarding an experience I had as being part of Viam Young Muslims in one of the outings and camps which we used to have. One young brother, he apparently brought some haram paraphernalia, particularly like a pornographic magazine with him. And it was ajeeb and really so shocking when we were advising this brother that he was still insistent on having this magazine with him and when we were throwing it away he was like what are you doing took, took, took the magazine out of the garbage and put it back into his uh, bag or something and it was just really shocking i mean what do you do with this person who's insisting on having pornographic magazines where you you know you have all these youth here and whatnot and he's not listening to the advice should we just kick him out you know kick this brother out and just you know, that'll be easy, quick fix. But no, he was still with us. We advised him. He continued to be part of the Halakat, the youth group. And fast forward, you know, 10, 15 years down. Now there's a national televised program where there is this Islamophobe, 100% kafir, who basically is demonizing a certain Islamic personality. And this brother just with a few words, just shuts him up in front of national TV, working for the deen of Islam. There are people who are imams, more, much more knowledgeable, who wouldn't have that capacity to say what he did and shut this big kafir on TV in front of I mean, perhaps millions of viewers. But this brother did that. So we have to be patient. Sometimes these people, the brothers who are doing major sins, can shake off their sins because of time and patience that others give in terms of nasiha and inshallah they'll come around to the straight path but well, this is just one example of many i mean there's so many muslims out there who are doing great work and before they used to do major sins they used to live a life of haram and we can't forget that you know we have to also realize that people are human and sometimes it takes time for them to shake off an action which we find detestable, but we have to have sabr. And this is basically what the big picture is all about in terms of the deen, in terms of nasiha. So give nasiha to these people, to the brothers, to the sinners, to just continue their sins, but and encourage them to do good deeds because inshallah it will be the good deeds which will shake off the bad deeds. Bi'idnillah. So going forward, Now let's go into prophetic actions without the purpose of ibadah. There are actions the Prophet ﷺ did without it being an act of ibadah. From customs of Arab culture, random actions without any purpose of ibadah. Okay. So therefore we too should not perform those actions of the Prophet ﷺ where his intention ﷺ was not for ibadah. And these include the following. You know, the Prophet ﷺ used to have long hair which touched his shoulders because men at that time used to keep long hair. Furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ wore a turban because it was the Arab custom. Okay, So should we 
perform this action of the Prophet it should not be performed for the purpose of your mother. Instead, if you do it, if you want to gain reward, we should do it for our love for him. And there, this is where that action will be rewarded for. So Imam Ash-Shatabi says that if certain actions are ibadah, where in actuality they're not, then this actually will lead to bid'ah. Okay. So how can we differentiate between the actions of the Prophet wasallam, which were done for the purpose of ibadah versus those which were not? According to the ulama, an action is considered an ibadah if the Prophet ﷺ had done the following. For example, number one, he commanded the action to be performed. Or he saw some prohibited the action from being done. Or three, he mentioned that there is a reward for doing that action. Number four is he mentioned that there is a punishment for leaving the action. So this is important in terms of guidelines of certain actions which were done by the Prophet some customarily or without the purpose of ibadah and in terms of how we can be rewarded for it if we do it for the love of the Prophet Okay, not for doing the action per se. Now going to turning to another topic which is the regular and the occasional sunnah. So the continuous sunnah are for example, when the Prophet ﷺ would do certain actions, the nawafil prayers regularly, sunnah muakkada, or the waitha prayer, for example, which he would not miss at night after the isha. Those are the continuous sunnahs and should be practiced by us as much as we can. Okay. But there's also the occasional sunnah. The occasional sunnah, this is where the Prophet ﷺ would do an action on occasion, like for example, recitation of Surah Sajda or Surah Insan in the Friday Fajr prayer. Okay. So, scars mention that we should avoid regularization of the occasional Sunnah acts and should not do it continuously. So, for example, every Fajr Salah you're reciting Surah Sajda or Surah Insan, so then you're making the occasional Sunnah into a continuous Sunnah. So in conclusion, the collection of the ahadith by Imam al nawi was selected based on principles and criteria that help Muslims practice Islam and fulfill their daily religious obligations with ease. As we have seen, one important aspect of Sharia is fulfilling our obligations. This hadith alongside hadith number one in the upcoming hadith number six, which inshallah we'll do next session, form the criteria by which Muslims can assess and evaluate their actions to ensure their correctness and acceptability. And it is through the sunnah that we are shown the correct and optimal way of performing our ibadat. Not doing these good deeds according to sunnah puts those good deeds at risk to be rejected as stated in this profound hadith. This is because Islam has been completed and perfected by Allah and its example perfected through His Messenger wasallam. And it's very important also that we increase our knowledge about the authentic sunnah and this will allow us to be deterred and prevented from with their actions. The very important ayah in the Quran in Surah Ma'idah. Today I have perfected your religion. This is where the authentic sunnah comes in. You know, to do actions and to do ibadat which are based on weak hadith is not proper. We have to be doing our ibadat based on the authentic sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because this is in line with the eye of perfection of this deen. So with this, inshallah, we will conclude. Jazakallah khairan for your attendance. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Subhanakallahu hamdik wa nashadu wa la ila illa ant. Wa sakfa kutubu ilayka. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.